Today, we're delving into the chilling case of Laura Murphy, the courageous survivor. It was a scorching day in Malibu, Florida, oblivious to the fact that Thanksgiving was around the corner. As Laura, a 19-year-old, strolled towards the store to grab some cigarettes, fate took a sinister turn. A vehicle pulled up beside her, marking the beginning of a harrowing ordeal. A man in a suit sat behind the wheel, extending an offer for a ride. Laura's discerning eyes studied him intently. Was he trustworthy? At first glance, he appeared perfectly ordinary, a slender figure in his late 30s, sporting dark blonde hair and a well-groomed appearance. He could easily pass for someone's father, a facade that concealed his true nature. Suppressing her doubts, she decided to accept the ride and climbed into the passenger seat, setting their journey in motion. However, the first hint of danger surfaced when he mentioned an urgent need to stop by his house and retrieve a forgotten notebook. Upon reaching his residence, he invited Laura to join him inside. Her instincts revolted, unwilling to step foot into the unknown, but her choices were swiftly stripped away, lost the moment she entered his vehicle. Minutes passed, and John returned, silently slipping a nylon rope around her neck, tightening it mercilessly until she succumbed to unconsciousness. As she regained awareness, she found herself plunged into an unfathomable nightmare. Now, let's fast forward 22 hours. A man was driving home when an alarming sight unfolded before him, an almost unclothed woman. Her hands and feet bound, emerged from the shadows and crawled onto the road, desperately clutching a towel around her body. Recognizing the urgency of the situation, this compassionate soul swiftly ushered her into his car, his concern evident as he inquired about what had transpired. Pale and trembling, she could only manage to utter the words, don't take me back there, without hesitation. He drove her straight to the hospital, where the medical team made a shocking discovery. Nearly 45% of her blood had been drained. Had she not received timely assistance, her life would have been extinguished within a mere 12 hours. As fragments of her memory resurfaced, Laura recalled the haunting image of being bound to a kitchen counter. The facade of kindness and normalcy projected by the men who offered her a ride had been shattered, revealing his true malevolent nature. At this point, the scene takes a chilling turn. Stripped of his clothes, the presence of a video camera nearby raises immediate concern, a combination of words no one ever wants to hear. John proceeds to commit a heinous act of sexual assault, followed by a disturbing display of his depravity. Armed with a syringe and surgical tubing, he extracts the blood from her veins, causing her to watch in abject horror as it empties into a jar, only to be consumed by him. Filled with disbelief and terror, she dares to question his actions, to which he callously replies, I'm taking your blood. I'm a vampire. In truth, John Brennan Crutchley was not a supernatural creature, but an engineer, deeply disturbed and twisted, a likely serial killer and undeniably a repulsive husband and father. His distorted journey began with a peculiar upbringing involving his mother's misguided desire for a daughter, resulting in John being dressed in pink attire until the age of five, coinciding with the arrival of his younger sister. The seeds of his disturbed psyche were sown in these early experiences. The transition proved challenging for him as he struggled to adapt to the changes. At the age of ten, his family relocated from West Virginia to Pennsylvania, where John developed a profound fascination for electronics and gadgets of all kinds. His tinkering endeavors eventually bore fruit when he secured a job repairing stereos. Although he exhibited a keen interest in math and science, his proficiency in languages, be it English or others, posed a significant hurdle. Following his high school years, he pursued a college education in physics, but encountered difficulties in maintaining satisfactory grades. However, during this period, he crossed paths with a young woman named Maud, whom he fell in love with and subsequently married. Despite his academic challenges, John managed to persevere, eventually earning his degree and securing a position as a project engineer at General Motors. He excelled in his role and even received an enticing job offer from Delco in Indiana. Regrettably, he accepted the position but failed to maintain a connection with his wife, ultimately neglecting the vows of their marriage. Their marriage dissolved in 1971, and Maud, for her part, felt a sense of relief to be free from John's grip. She shared with others the unsettling truth about his sexually violent tendencies, revealing that he would provoke fights as a means to become aroused. Four years later, John embarked on a fresh chapter of his life, marked by a new residence, a new spouse, and an updated job title as an electronics manager at TRW in Fairfax, Virginia. Notably, TRW engaged in extensive collaborations with NASA and the Department of Defense, affording John Pentag and security clearance due to his involvement in developing a computer language for the U.S. Navy. Amidst his demanding work hours, and perhaps even during them, John delved into increasingly unconventional and kinky practices. He displayed a 
willingness to explore any boundary, a telltale sign that caught the attention of FBI profiler Robert Ressler as the originator of the term serial killer and one of the pioneering profilers within the federal agency, Ressler recognized these proclivities as red flags associated with individuals capable of heinous crimes. John embraced a wide array of unconventional sexual preferences, including pornography, partner swapping, bondage, blood drinking, and various forms of group sex involving both men and women. These desires knew no bounds for him. Surprisingly, his second wife, Karen, appeared more accepting of their sexual explorations compared to his previous spouse. However, in Robert Ressler's book, Whoever Fights Monsters, significant attention was dedicated to John, shedding light on his darker inclinations. Despite Karen's perception of her husband as merely being kinky, she remained oblivious to the depths of his disturbing appetites. Unbeknownst to her, John's name remained unlinked to three unsolved murders, one of which involved Deborah Fitzjohn, a 25-year-old woman who tragically met her demise in the woods. Her life was cut short in 1978, almost a year after her disappearance following a date with John. The connection between her murder and John's involvement remained unnoticed by Karen. Another unsettling case involved Pamela Kimbrough, a 23-year-old Navy messenger. Her last known sighting was on March 25, 1982. Tragically, her lifeless body was discovered the following day, bound, sexually assaulted, and strangled, left in the backseat of her car. The list of victims continued to grow when, ten months later, Carol Ann Mona, a Navy clerk, vanished after visiting a local nightclub. Her remains were eventually found concealed beneath the rocks of a seawall in early May 1983. During the same year, John, accompanied by his wife and their two-year-old son, relocated to Malibu, Florida. John had secured a position as an engineer with the Harris Corporation, a renowned technology company heavily involved in projects for the United States Department of Defense. His top-secret security clearance made him an ideal candidate. However, it raises the unsettling possibility that he may have been attempting to escape the implications of his potential involvement involvement in the three unsolved murders up north. The timing couldn't have been more fortuitous for John, as the police's attempts to link him to the women's deaths proved futile. Even in the case of Debbie, the victim with the strongest connection to John, they struggled to establish a direct link. Her last known day on Earth was likely Friday, January 27, 1978, when she visited John's trailer in Fairfax, Virginia. Unfortunately, she was never seen alive again. Delving deeper into Debbie's disappearance, her family conducted their own investigation, unearthing the fact that she had been casually dating John for approximately nine days before she vanished. He was the last person known to have seen her, yet his account remained consistent. According to John, she had indeed visited his trailer, but he fell asleep, only to discover she was gone upon waking. However, it was evident that Debbie's abrupt disappearance, occurring a mere two days prior, left no room for the possibility that she willingly walked away from her life. After Debbie's disappearance, her employer at Texaco, where she worked as a secretary, offered her the opportunity to take a few college courses that would pave the way for career advancement within the company. Naturally, she felt elated and began envisioning a brighter future. Despite their earnest efforts, the police faced insurmountable obstacles in pushing the investigation forward. However, nine months later, Debbie's decomposing, unclothed body was discovered in the woods, in close proximity to John's trailer. Tragically, not only were authorities unable to determine the cause of her death, but they also failed to gather any substantial incriminating evidence against John or any other potential suspects. Consequently, no charges were ever filed. Then, on November 21, 1985, while John's second wife, Karen, and their son were away, John encountered 19-year-old Laura Murphy in Malibu. During her conversations with the police, Laura bravely recounted every detail she could remember about the vampire rapist, shedding light on the horrifying ordeal. Following the initial violation and blood drinking, John restrained Laura by handcuffing her and confining her to the bathtub. This horrifying sequence of events repeated itself three more times. Each assault took place in the kitchen, captured by the video camera, followed by the draining of her blood and her temporary storage in the bathtub. However, an opportunity for escape presented itself when John made an error in judgment. The following morning, he left for work, leaving Laura alone in the house. Before departing, he issued a warning, stating that if she attempted to escape, his brother, who purportedly resided there, would kill her. Despite her weakened state, on the brink of death due to the torment and blood loss, Laura mustered the strength to remain alert in the bathtub. Sensing that no one else was present in the house, she summoned the last remnants of her energy and managed to reach the window. Miraculously, luck was 
on her side as she discovered the lock was already broken, providing her with a crucial opportunity to flee. Summoning her last ounces of strength, Laura managed to pull herself through the window and reach the road, where she was fortunate enough to encounter compassionate individuals who promptly stopped to assist her. With their aid, she directed the police straight to the perpetrator's residence. In 1985, Malibu, Florida was a relatively small community, home to fewer than 2,000 residents. Situated near the larger city of Palm Bay, it offered Laura a relatively uncomplicated path to retrace her steps back to the location where she endured the most harrowing hours of her life. Equipped with a search warrant, detectives arrived at John Crutchley's doorstep in the early hours of the morning, approximately 2.30 a.m. Their investigation swiftly validated Laura's account as they discovered the presence of syringes and the camera, although the video had already been erased. The evidence uncovered quickly aligned with the horrifying details Laura had shared, substantiating her brave testimony. However, rather than outright denying the events, John chose a disturbing tactic by attempting to shift blame onto Laura, claiming that she had willingly desired rough treatment. To support his twisted narrative, investigators discovered Laura's identification card within the confines of his residence, alongside a stack of others. Some of these IDs belonged to missing girls, but John offered an explanation for those as well, asserting that they had simply left their identification behind after he provided them with rides. Subsequently, when law enforcement conducted a search of John's office at the Harris Corporation in Florida, they stumbled upon explicit photographs depicting women engaged in graphic bondage. Disturbingly, some of the images depicted John on choking the women with his bare hands, though he insisted that all activities were consensual. According to John, local authorities were aware of his deviant behavior, recognizing the presence of a deranged individual in their midst. Consequently, they sought assistance from the FBI, leading to the involvement of Agent Robert Ressler. Renowned as the serial killer whisperer, Agent Robert Ressler concurred with the Florida police, affirming that John Crutchley was a uniquely disturbed individual. Ressler firmly believed that John had engaged in similar heinous acts in the past, potentially even more grievous ones. The stack of identification cards discovered further supported this hypothesis. In addition, several women's necklaces were found in John's possession, which he claimed belonged to his wife, Karen. However, these necklaces did not match Karen's known jewelry collection, and John struggled to provide a satisfactory explanation for the jar of hair found among his belongings. The presence of dog collars, despite John not owning any pets, raised further suspicion. Equally unsettling were the 72 index cards, each bearing the name of a different woman, along with her astrological sign and explicit details about her sexual preferences. Astonishingly, one of these cards belonged to Deborah Fitzjohn, a key piece of the puzzle. The investigators diligently pursued leads in Virginia, ultimately unearthing the connection between Deborah and John shedding light on the disturbing web of his past actions. Among the items discovered in John's possession were documents related to highly classified government information, sparking curiosity and concern within various government agencies. The presence of such sensitive materials in his house raised questions about potential espionage charges. Moreover, John faced imminent charges of rape and kidnapping as the evidence against him continued to mount. However, he attempted to shift blame onto pornography, claiming that the ideas for his actions were derived from a magazine. His wife, Karen, on the other hand, struggled to fully comprehend the gravity of his crimes, although she harbored a belief in his guilt. In Robert Ressler's book, he quoted Karen describing the acts committed by John as a gentle rape, downplaying the extreme brutality involved. Despite initially attempting to support her husband, Karen eventually reached a breaking point when John accepted a plea deal prompting her to file for divorce. Despite both Karen and John's initial expectations of receiving only a short prison sentence, they were sorely mistaken. The court was apprised of the heinous details of John's actions, including his involvement with the women whose IDs were discovered. The judge, thoroughly disturbed by the extent of John's crimes, handed down a 25-year sentence with a mandatory parole period of 50 years. However, John served only 10 years, as he was released early for exhibiting good behavior in 1996. Nevertheless, his notoriety rendered him unwelcome and unwanted throughout the state of Florida. The city of Malabar adamantly refused to readmit him, and Melbourne, Florida also wanted nothing to do with him. Eventually, the Orlando Probation and Restitution Center reluctantly became the designated place for his residence much to the chagrin of the local community. Sometimes, circumstances have a way of resolving themselves. When John arrived at the probation center, they conducted a routine drug test, not expecting any inmate to foolishly violate their parole on the very first day. However, John proved them wrong. The drug test revealed the presence of marijuana in his system. He attempted to justify it as a result of secondhand exposure from other inmates, but his explanation fell on deaf ears. As a consequence of this parole violation, John was sent back to prison to serve 
serve his entire sentence. Surprisingly, it was not his previous convictions for rape and kidnapping that triggered the life sentence, but rather the marijuana incident, which constituted his third strike under the Three Strikes Law. During his return to prison, he was placed in solitary confinement due to his dishonesty. Disturbingly, John engaged in self-harm by piercing his genitals multiple times, with one of the piercings intended for attaching a padlock. So let your imagination run wild with that particular detail. John claimed his self-inflicted act was a testament of devotion to Karen, despite their divorce long ago. Following that incident, John's life in prison remained mostly uneventful, although some inmates alleged that he boasted about murdering over two dozen women. However, in 2002, everything came to an end. John was discovered in his cell with a bag over his head, a victim of autoerotic asphyxia. Thank you for joining us today. If you enjoy getting all the crime stories, don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell to stay updated. Until our paths cross again, stay well.